Hi everyone, I'm Tricia from the Northwestern Melbourne Primary Health Network. Welcome to our webinar this evening. Um, I'm just going to do a little bit of a spiel at the start and then introduce our speaker. Um, welcome to asthma in spring, allergies and thunderstorms and we're just in time, it's two days away. Um, <laughs> First of all, um, I'd like to start by acknowledge, on behalf of the Northwestern Melbourne Primary Health Network, I'd like to acknowledge the cu traditional custodians of the land on which our work takes place, the Wur Wurundjeri Woiwurrung people, the Boon Wurrung people and the Wathaurung people. We pay respects to elders past, present and emerging, as well as pay respects to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in the session with us today. Just going to move on to some housekeeping. First of all, um, all attendees are muted. Please ask questions via the Q&A box, not the chat box, the Q&A. Um, the session is being recorded and your questions will be anonymous to protect your privacy. And please ensure you join the session using the name you registered with so that we know, so that we can mark off your attendance this is particularly important, well, for us just to know who came, but also if you need CPD points or you're registering for CPD points, if we don't have the correct name, we won't know you were there, you attended. Um, so, of course, to change your name after entering a Zoom session, uh, just click on the participants button at the top of the Zoom window. Um, Hover your mouse over your name in the participants list on the right side of the Zoom window. Click on rename and enter the name you registered with. Um, thanks, That we really appreciate it if you could do that. It'd be great, thank you. Um, next, I'd just like to introduce our speaker, Marg Gordon. Um, Marg's an RN, asthma and respiratory educator and a senior clinical consultant. Uh, Marg has worked as an asthma and respiratory educator in primary care for 17 years. She operates a nurse-led clinic in the eastern suburbs of Melbourne, working collaboratively with GPs to improve the health, health outcomes of respiratory patients. You've been had a busy couple of years, Marg. Marg also works as a clinical, clinical consultant for National Asthma Council Australia, contributing to the education program, providing workshops to GPs, practice nurses and allied health professionals around Australia. And now I'd just like to hand you over to Mark. Thanks very much, Mark. Thank you, Tricia. I'll just share my screen. Hello, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us tonight. Um, I always think when I hear that introdu introduction to myself, how much older I'm getting, you know. <laughs> years and years in primary care. But anyway, that's a good thing, lots of experience. And Trish is right, really perfect timing to have a webinar on um, asthma in spring, allergies and thunderstorms, because here we are, wildly fluctuating weather, pollens starting everywhere and uh, flowers and wattles out and about. I'd just like to also um, add my acknowledgement to country to that of North, uh, uh, North Western PHM. Sorry, I'm just trying to click my slides and couldn't make it work. Uh, these are the learning objectives for tonight. So we're going to have a little talk about allergic rhinitis and the association between those uh, allergic rhinitis and asthma and about the treatment for allergic rhinitis. We'll stop then for some questions in the middle and then we'll talk about thunderstorm asthma management and um, touch on written asthma action plans and first aid through the thunderstorm asthma season. But really my learning objective for tonight is that you get the opportunity to uh, ask any questions that, that you've got. So as Tricia said, please do ask those questions in the chat box or the Q&A box and uh, we'll make sure that we get, get the answers for you. So I hope you're all really familiar with the Australian Asthma Handbook. It's a free... Um, resource available there on that web address www.asthmahandbook.org.au. The latest version 2.2 was just la launched in April this year 2022 
uh, with the, the latest updates. It's constantly being updated by a team of um, multidisciplinary health professionals that are, are the background uh, professionals that we use to keep this, uh, this uh, resource current. It's a really easy website to use. So you'll see the toolbar across the top there with all the different categories and you just touch on those and drop down or well, there's a very good search function as well. So if you haven't had a look at the handbook, I encourage you to please do so. They're free and available for everyone. And I also hope that you're really familiar with NAC's website, www.nationalasthma.org.au. Once again, a really easy website to use. It's for health professionals and the public. So there's a lot of resources on there. Everything up to date to do with asthma is on that website. So please um, go, go there and have a look as well. Uh, everything that I talk about tonight and all the resources that I show you tonight are available on either of those two sites. So let's have a little think about allergic rhinitis or hay fever as the public would call it. And it's a really common condition in Australia. And I think when you travel about this country, you can see why, because we've just, I mean, it's an enormous country for one thing, but we've got a lot of different environments within our country. So we've got a lot of different plants and triggers for allergic rhinitis. So approximately 90% of Australians have allergic rhinitis. It's often underdiagnosed and therefore undertreated or suboptimally self-treated by people who will say to you, yes, I get a little bit of hay fever, but it doesn't really affect me. Well, after my presentation tonight, I hope you're going to realise that allergic rhinitis certainly does affect people and certainly those with asthma. It's really common, um, really in all age groups, kids can even have allergic rhinitis, but it's quite common. And often people are sensitive to multiple allergens, so that makes it more difficult for them. So they may have it seasonally or they may have it perennially. And you may have heard us speak about United Airways disease. So that's when we're talking about the upper airway, the nose, the back of the throat, the sinuses. Uh, which is affected by inflammation, and that gives us the allergic rhinitis, or asthma in the lower airways of the lungs, uh, which is inflammation of the small airways of the lungs, giving us asthma. So often people have both. Allergic rhinitis is an independent risk factor for asthma in both children and adults, and the presence of both conditions, so allergic rhinitis with asthma, sometimes means that the asthma can be more difficult to control. So there's a greater risk of a more severe uh, episode or flare up of asthma for those with allergic rhinitis if their allergic rhinitis is not well treated. So how do we assess for it? So often people may tell you, certainly in my clinic, because it's a respiratory clinic, that's what we're talking about. So I will always ask them um, whether they have allergic rhinitis, whether they had it as a younger person, whether they still have it now. Very uh, similar history questions as we would ask when we're investigating the asthma. So we talk to them about common symptoms, whether they have with itchy, watery eyes, runny nose, sneezing, that constant clearing of their throat, um, something perhaps dripping down post-nasal drip, cough or frequent sore throats, snoring or mouth breathing. These can all be symptoms of allergic rhinitis that people will tell you about. We ask about the frequency of those symptoms. Is it seasonal? Is it perennial? So perennial means it's non-seasonal. It can happen all year round. And the common triggers for perennial rhinitis are things like the dust mites, the molds, pet dander perhaps. Uh, if it's seasonal, then it's more likely to be triggered by things that are coming and going. So spring, summer triggers of grasses and pollens, ryegrass in Victoria in particular certain weeds, flowers, all types of things. If it's occupational rhinitis, which can happen, that can be chemicals, irritants, fumes, those sorts of things, and those symptoms completely go away when the person's not around those types of triggers. <clears throat> so we'll ask about that frequency of, of the events and the impact that those symptoms have on day-to-day -day function. And this is where I think it's really interesting and important that we do check with people. Is it affecting them day-to-day? -day? Are they constantly blocked up? Are they constantly clearing their throat and coughing, watery eyes perhaps? Or is it just very mild and it doesn't actually uh, trouble them too much? We ask, <clears throat> excuse me, we ask if, we, if they know if they've got any identifiable 
identifiable triggers and often people do have a pretty good idea. And then we can do a physical assessment. So we're checking the upper airways, as I said, for swollen turbinates. Um, we look for that transverse nasal crease for particularly kids will get it from constantly wiping their nose or sometimes those really just dark circles under the eyes um, indicating sinus congestion and sinus pain. We also ask about a history for asthma and eczema. So you probably heard that term, the allergic march, where people will have perhaps eczema as a baby or young child, may or may not go on to develop hay fever and asthma. And if that's the case, it's often allergic triggers that are affecting um, people and giving them those symptoms. So what do we do about it? Once we've decided that, yes, people have got allergic rhinitis, if they're interested in understanding what their triggers are or we need to know for treatment purposes what their triggers are, then we can offer a skin prick test. And that's the really the gold standard for diagnosing. So they would go to an allergen specialist for that test and often tested for, say, 20 um, different allergens on the skin, adults usually done on the forearm, children will often do this test on their back just because it's easier to get a wider area of skin and they tend to lie still if they're lying on their tummies, they might lay a bit more still. So we can do that skin prick test and that will give us a clear uh, diagnosis of the triggers. We can also do serum specific IgE tests now, and those are a lot more widely available. You may know them as RAST tests. They're a lot more widely available now than they were, and we can test for a few different allergens in the one blood test now, which is also good. The limitations of these tests are that the positive results don't categorically prove that those allergens are causing allergic rhinitis. They prove that the person is sensitive to those. So we have to just make that, that um, presumption that that's what's actually causing the allergic rhinitis. Tests that are not useful are food allergy testing. Generally, food allergies don't cause rhinitis. And I know there will be some of you there that will be shaking your heads. And certainly some people do react in that way to some of the preservatives and some of those things. You know, people will say they'll drink red wine and they'll have 16 sneezes, for example. So sometimes it's in the preservatives that can, can um, cause that reaction. The FBE and total IgE is not of much clinical use in diagnosing allergic rhinitis. You would understand that IgE over 300 can indicate asthma though. And then there's those unproven testing methods, kinesiology and reflexology, hair analysis. I think it's always really important to be very careful if we're talking to people about skin prick allergy testing or any allergy testing, but it's done um, under supervision and correctly so that we know that people aren't just avoiding things for no real clinical reason. So there's lots of treatments available for allergic rhinitis, and I'm sure you know lots of them, but top of the list always comes the intranasal corticosteroid sprays. So you'll know lots of these, and there's a slide uh, that I'll be showing you of the latest chart of all the sprays. They're widely available now, some are over the counter, some are scripted, um, but they act as an anti-inflammatory uh, spray directly to the sinus cavities, the nose and the sinus cavities, so that it's reducing the inflammation at exactly where it's happening, exactly the same as our inhaled corticosteroids uh, do for asthma. It's always really important to explain to people when we're talking about intranasal corticosteroids or inhaled corticosteroids as well, that they're very different to oral steroids, that they're completely safe and they're not likely to get any side effects from them. If they do, they'll be localised side effects. Some people can get um, blood noses perhaps or a bit of a tickly dry throat from these sprays, but otherwise are completely safe even though they've got that word corticosteroid in there. We've got antihistamine nasal sprays. Really important to explain to people that these are cheaper than the intranasal corticosteroid sprays, but they literally will just um, dry up the nasal cavities. They don't treat inflammation at all. They're antihistamines, so they're not treating inflammation if that's the cause of the allergic rhinitis. And then we get a combination spray that's got both antihistamine and the corticosteroid component unit. They are scripted medications. They are more expensive, but they're certainly very effective for the people that use them. 
uh, rap rapid acting oral antihistamines uh, can be used. So things like Claritine, Telfast, any of those can be an add-on treatment for allergic rhinitis added on to the nasal sprays. Or if the symptoms are very mild and very seasonal, some people are using the oral antihistamines alone just to treat those symptoms and, and that's enough for them. We can use things like the saline sinus roots um, that can be in a spray form, the salty sprays such as FES or in the actual sort of um, squeezing sinus rinse bottle form that people will use and that just washes the nose and the sinus cavities out and can uh, help reduce the symptoms for people. Uh, allergen avoidance and I've talked about the importance of really knowing what allergen it is if we're going to talk to people about allergen avoidance and is really possible in our environment if you're allergic to ryegrass pollen for example really from you know October onwards in Victoria or southern Australia then you can't avoid ryegrass pollen it's in the air so that's pretty difficult. We can have specific allergen desensitization or immunotherapy that's a lot more common than it used to be. Once again, people would need to be seeing an allergen specialist to access this treatment, but it's sublingual now or subcutaneous in injection form. Usually uh, a minimum of four to six months, perhaps up to two or three years of treatment required. So there's significant costs involved for people. The sublingual and subcutaneous methods work uh, about equally the same. And uh, the subcutaneous, of course, are given um, uh, under observation. So generally people would be started with that treatment with their allergen specialist and then would come back to a GP clinic to continue it over that time. In people who have a confirmed allergen and it's possible to be desensitized for, it modifies the allergic immune response and can be very life-changing uh, for people and make them feel completely well again at this type of time of year and reduce their allergic risks. And if they also suffer from asthma, that can help to improve their asthma control as well. In this group of people, oral corticosteroids should be avoided. We shouldn't be using those for allergic rhinitis if we can help it. There is an allergy treatment plan available at another website, www.allergy.org.au, and they have a lot of resources. And I've just got a couple to show you on my next slide. So uh, the slide on, on the left there is the pattern of symptoms that's talking, that's an NAC resource and that just goes through uh, the mild symptoms and how we may treat them. So we're talking about oral antihistamines there. Um, if that works, terrific. If it doesn't work, then they go on to the intranasal corticosteroid sprays. But if it's more persistent or moderate to severe, then we'll start people on the intranasal corticosteroid sprays and then you'll see some add-on treatments there and when to refer to a specialist. And then uh, the other one is the ASCIA website allergy treatment plan. And I just popped that up there. I know it's difficult to read, but it's just good to see because we talk a lot about um, asthma plans. And this is one for people with allergens. And that's just a good reminder that they can use them. And this is the treatment chart, the nasal spray treatment chart that I was referring to earlier. This has just been updated this year from NAC, so this is the new chart that's available and it's got the sprays divided into groups there of the corticosteroid ones that we recommend, the um, combinations there, the antihistamine corticosteroids, the saline rinses can come in a spray form or the bottle form as I, as I mentioned and then there's some antihistamine sprays, anticholinergic and some decongestant sprays. So, these ones here we don't use as much, particularly if it's um, moderate, more severe condition, we would be using this group up here. That resource is available on the NAC website, or if you want it in poster form, you can order that on, online and it'll be sent out to you. And these are just some new resources that are also available. Well, the intranasal spray technique is not a new resource, but it's currently being upgraded. So that one will be available any time in the next weeks. 
couple of weeks, um, which is an information paper on uh, how to use the sprays correctly. And then the Allergic Rhinitis Treatment Planner is a relatively new resource available, and that's um, to give to people as, you know, as an asthma, oh, as, sorry, as an allergic rhinitis plan for them so that it spells out their triggers and it spells out their treatment over springtime or um, over the period of time when they're uh, suffering from their allergic rhinitis. So I'll just have a little break there and see if there's any questions. Oh, sorry, I'm ahead of myself. A specialist referral. So if there's no response to treatment, three to four weeks. Now, we've got to be careful with that three to four weeks because it's a little like asthma. We will start people on their intranasal corticosteroid sprays, give them a couple of weeks and the symptoms are resolved and that's terrific. If they stop using it, those symptoms will return. So you really want to um, reiterate that they, once they start on them, they need to continue on them. We usually say one spray in to the nose twice a day for a couple of weeks and then one spray once a day would be the maintenance treatment for intranasal corticosteroid sprays. So give them a good trial if there's no response to that at all and you feel pretty confident that they've been using it well, perhaps they've tried the sinus rinse in addition um, and may have added on an oral antihistamine if there's still no response. That's a very good reason to send them on to an allergist and allergist specialist and find out what's actually happening. If the symptoms um, yeah, are severe or persistent or unresponsive, they need to be referred. If they continue to have poor asthma control despite regular preventive treatment of their asthma and despite additional treatment for their allergic rhinitis, very good idea to refer on. Sometimes if there's other allergic conditions present that struggling people becomes complex, refer. Same with the food and occupational allergy. Sometimes that's a good reason. Or if they've got other conditions, such as the resistance, sinus obstruction or sinus infection, things that are going on, ear problems. And of course, if they need to be referred for their immunotherapy, then we need to make sure they're seeing a specialist for that. Now, here I am. Any questions? I'll just have a little stop there and see if trisha has got any questions for me. So, Marg, at the moment, there's nothing in the Q&A. Okay, terrific. Thank you. So I'll just go straight on to thunderstorm asthma then and we'll have some questions at the end. Hopefully. Okay, so thunderstorm asthma. What is thunderstorm asthma? I'm sure many of you remember the um, really severe thunderstorm asthma event that occurred in November in 2016. Uh, and that's probably when we all started talking about thunderstorm asthma a lot more than we did prior to that. So there's two definitions here I've got for you. So the first one is an observed increase in acute bronchospasm cases following the occurrence of a thunderstorm in the local vicinity. So that's quite a broad generalised um, type of uh, description and then the National Asthma Council one says an unusual cluster of allergic asthma flare-ups including severe acute asthma associated with some types of thunderstorms in spring or early summer. So a little bit more detailed, a little bit more cautious and I think um, as we go through the presentation you'll understand why that's such a descriptive uh, way of describing thunderstorm asthma. So um, I just put this up because I, I want to discuss that it wasn't just that 2016 event, although that was a very severe and dramatic event. Thunderstorm asthma events had been occurring prior to that. And if you cast your eyes over here to the year, month and date, you will see that November is the culprit in southeastern Australia particularly in Victoria. So we, all of the events have in fact occurred in November and you can see back to the first one that was recorded 1984. So quite a long time ago. The time of the event is quite significant. So those that occur in the early um, morning or evening, um, this one that was sort of in the wee hours when most people would have been asleep, 
When we look at the hospital presentations and the numbers that were actually admitted, they're much lower when less people were out and about and being affected. And of course, that brings us to the 21st of November 2016, because that thunderstorm hit Melbourne at six o'clock at night. It had been an extremely hot, windy day in Melbourne that day. Uh, the thunderstorm was forecast. But you can see here because or partly because of that time of day and partly because of the severity of it, the numbers of people affected were extraordinary. Over three and a half thousand people presented to emergency department in the, in the following 24 hours, 35 into ICU and very sadly, uh, 10 people died that evening. Uh, we would remember though that um, Melbourne's not the only place that these events do occur. So we, sorry, I beg your pardon. Um, there's been uh, episodes of thunderstorm asthma in uh, New South Wales. So Tamworth, Wagga and Newcastle there, and you'll see one in Canberra. And there've also been some thunderstorm asthma events recorded overseas in the UK. I know of a couple. So uh, it's just interesting to reflect on that. But that's why it's really good to have this discussion early in spring so that we can get prepared for that October, November uh, uh, ryegrass onslaught that happens. So these are some of the headlines that occurred um, that day. The, there was an, uh, an inquest into those deaths, of course. It really was uh, a, a, horrible, a horrible thing to um, witness and to listen to and to know that those many, that many people were affected. There were a lot of media coverage about the event and there was a lot of talk about the response to the ambulance services, you know, that people couldn't get an ambulance and that people couldn't uh, get help. But there were equally as many stories of extraordinary care in the community, uh, both through general practices, pharmacies, um, yeah, the ambulance service, all services were stretched and completely overwhelmed, but there were a lot of people saved by people understanding asthma first aid. So these are some of the stats in the 30 hours after six o'clock on the 21st of November. As we said, about three and a half thousand people presented to uh, public hospital emergency departments, a 672% increase above the normal average for that time of year. So you can understand the stress that caused to the health services there. And then admissions into the public hospitals, as we said, a huge increase, 992% uh, increase of people being admitted into a hospital uh, with asthma on it, you know, within a 30 hour period, if you can just imagine that. Um, if you imagine that that would happen during COVID, thankfully we didn't have any uh, thunderstorm asthma episodes in the spring years, in the spring times that we had COVID affecting our health services and um, fingers crossed the same, we don't have one this year. So what causes it? This is the um, type of accumulation of things that have to happen to uh, causes a thunderstorm asthma event. It's not every single thunderstorm and it's really important to reassure the public of that, that it's not every single thunderstorm. We need a few of these, um, we, well we need all of these uh, components for it to be uh, a thunderstorm asthma type of storm. So high concentrations of allergic material and it's found to be mainly ryegrass pollen in that October, November time of year, that's what's mostly out. There has been a couple of separate papers written now, which also refer to dust as being a trigger and lightning as being part of the thunderstorm event as well. So that's some things that they're also uh, adding into this little list of the springtime conditions. We need a thunderstorm outflow, and I'll talk to you about that on my next slide. And we need something that makes these pollens or triggered, triggered allergic material are uh, very, very small to what we call a respirable size particle of less than 2.5. So these are tiny little particles and I'll explain that in the following slides as well. And then of course, the number of people that are exposed who are sensitive to the allergen, who may have allergic rhinitis and may or may not know that they have asthma. 
The little map of Victoria down the bottom there, I know that's difficult to see with the shading, but that was the uh, Western District rainfall that was received in from September to November of that 2016 years. And so that very dark colour, the highest rainfall there in the Western District, just indicates to you that there was a really high growth, high rain, and therefore high growth of the grass itself, the rye grass, and so a lot of pollen in that particular year. And that also explains why some years we don't get that thunderstorm asthma, because if there hasn't been that grass growth in, in those districts where our winds come from, then we're not going to get the saturation of rye grass pollen. So just talking about the type of thunderstorm, and this slide talks to us about, or it's a visual representation of one hypothesis of why a particular storm will create an event and why other storms won't. So as I said, we've got lots of pollen grains there being swept up into the storm. So that's what we call the updraft. That's the wind taking the pollen up. And the theory is that once it's up there in those storm clouds, the moisture in the cloud, or now perhaps the lightning in that cloud, will rupture the pollen and put it into those tiny little particles that, that I mentioned that can be easily breathed right down into the small airways of the lungs. And then we get this downdraft, which is the cold, dry, or the cold air that's coming down from the storm before the rain. So that comes, brings those pollen fragments right down to ground level where people can breathe it in. And that comes in the wind in, in the storm ahead of the rain. So I think that's a really great way of sort of explaining uh, how it actually happens. And that's that storm outflow and makes us understand a bit more about why it's not every single thunderstorm. And this is a video which just um, demonstrates to us the rupture of the ryegrass pollen. So fingers crossed that this is going to work. So these are the normal pollen granules that are floating around in the air. They are too large to breathe right down into the small airways of the lungs. They're normally trapped in the nose, which is why they can certainly cause allergic rhinitis, uh, but very difficult to be breathed right down. But in a thunderstorm when they're swept up, just watching these here, you'll see that they rupture and they distribute then into the air these tiny little particles of pollen, which certainly can be inhaled. So just watching again. I think that's a really nice, uh, once again, visual representation of what happens um, to the pollen particles when we're breathing them in. Okay, so who is at increased risk? We understand now the features that we've got to have in a certain storm in springtime as to why that might cause an asthma event. Um, so who's at increased risk? Anyone that's sensitive to ryegrass pollen or strong dust that's being swept um, into an area where it might not normally be. Those with allergic rhinitis with or without asthma as a diagnosis. Anyone with asthma, or those that have ever had asthma, particularly if they're poorly controlled or not taking any preventer. So you would be familiar, I hope that the asthma guidelines now say that even people with mild asthma definitely benefit from using preventer therapy or inhaled corticosteroid therapy, even on an as needed basis. And for those uh, at risk of springtime asthma, this is certainly a time that we'll be thinking about introducing that therapy for them. Uh, those that are exposed to open air before and during a thunderstorm in pollen season, if they're sensitive to these things, as we've said, those living in an area prone to the high pollen counts, and that's historically southeastern Australia. So a lot of people actually are at the increased risk. Our general advice that we would give to people, and this is everyone at this time of year, so we want to make sure that people are aware of the pollen count. And um, I notice now on um, commercial TV, you see the ads for the antihistamines. I've seen a couple of the Demazin ads coming out now. And certainly in the weather reports, you'll see the pollen count has become a feature uh, of the weather right now on TV, which is really great to see. But often people do like the apps, so you can refer them to the Oz Pollen app or the Air Raider app or the pollen forecast 
The Vic Emergency website has a lot of information about pollen and storms and the New South Wales State Emergency Service the same. So there's a lot, uh, we would be encouraging people now that have, uh, were affected certainly in a uh, previous thunderstorm event or that we feel may be at risk if they are, as I said, poorly controlled with their asthma or underestimating uh, their allergic rhinitis. We can help them to make sure that we know the at-risk days. And then we can advise that um, on those days, they may be able to stay indoors or if in their workplace, close their windows or in their car, turn off their air con or use on the recirculated air on those high pollen days, just to try and minimise the risk of exposure for them. If they have any signs of asthma, then they should be following their personal asthma action plan. Or if they don't know that they've got asthma and they experience symptoms of asthma, then they follow asthma first aid steps. And if the asthma symptoms are worsening, then we advise everyone to dial triple O and say they're having an asthma attack and make sure that they can get some help and some treatment. A medical management for people with asthma and allergic rhinitis. So let's be proactive about it. That's what tonight's all about. Make sure we know what we're talking about. Make sure we're helping to identify at-risk people in our communities and in our practices and encourage them to come in and have a review appointment, particularly of their asthma management, so that everyone's as well controlled from an asthma point of view as they can be. We want that at all times of the year, but we particularly want that at this time of year. And then uh, anyone for allergic rhinitis, we wanna be checking them out as we've already said through this presentation. So we're managing people according to their guidelines. And the current asthma guidelines say that most people would have uh, inhaled corticosteroid therapy now. And that means that they can be on um, an inhaled corticosteroid daily low dose with Saba as their reliever, so a Ventolin as their reliever, or they can be on um, a combination therapy such as budesonide for Motorol over springtime as a PRN therapy or as a daily maintenance therapy. And they can use that as their um, maintenance and reliever therapy. We should always be making sure that people are using their devices correctly and that they're adhering to what they're scripted correctly. And that goes all time of year, but certainly in the springtime, we wanna be checking that. And making sure that people understand they should be carrying reliever therapy if they have asthma. As I mentioned, that's a short acting beta agonist or an anti-inflammatory or preventer type reliever, the combination reliever. Encourage people to be proactive with their allergic rhinitis treatment. So this is a really good time to be talking to them about when to introduce their intranasal corticosteroids about four weeks prior to or any time throughout the pollen season if they need it. And then often, especially those with asthma and allergic rhinitis should stay on that inhale intranasal corticosteroid treatment right through the spring season. So from now, September through to about December, and then ensure that their asthma and rhinitis action plans are up to date and that they understand what to do if they get worsening symptoms so that their plan's not just a bit of paper, they actually know how to follow it. So medical management for those with allergic rhinitis who don't have asthma, so I've talked about the current guidelines of treatment. We might be able to identify those that are allergic to grass pollens, so we need to ask them, or we might be doing the tests that I mentioned, and then we encourage them to be on the intranasal corticosteroid treatment uh, from now through the pollen season. But we also need to chat to people that may live outside of these areas that would be traveling into these areas, making sure that they've got medications with them or know how to access medications. And then talking to these group, there were those with allergic rhinitis, but who don't have a diagnosis of asthma and explaining that to them that perhaps they may develop symptoms of asthma. And if they do, would they recognize them and would they know what to do? So how to get a reliever therapy, how to use it properly and understand and um, be able to instigate asthma first aid. And then there's the rest of the population. What do we tell them? Certainly in my clinic, um, after the thunderstorm asthma event in 2016, I was just booked out 
everyone was anxious about a their asthma management which was a good thing so that was good for reviews but people were really frightened I think and afraid so we need to reassure the general population that don't have any allergic rhinitis and don't have asthma that their risk of thunderstorm asthma is quite low but it's a real opportunity to raise awareness of asthma first aid for everyone so great opportunity to bring out the first aid charts talk to people about it make sure that they understand how to help someone in the community if they uh, do suffer from um, asthma during a thunderstorm event so it brings us on to written asthma action plans. We all talk about written asthma action plans and we know that um, a lot of people don't have them. We're much better at giving action plans to kids because the childcare centres and schools demand them. We're not so great at doing written asthma action plans for adults. And uh, I think it's just a topic that those of us that work in respiratory continually talk about. But we know that action plans improve health outcomes for people because it gives them steps to follow should those symptoms develop. And it helps people to monitor their symptoms, but it helps them to take action as well. So it helps to recognise worsening asthma, those symptoms generally wheeze, cough, shortness of breath, waking at night when they previously haven't been with asthma. The plan writes down their advice for how to manage that, adjusting their medications, advice on when to see their doctor and advice on when to call an, as, uh, an ambulance. So we really wanna make sure that everyone with asthma has a written asthma action plan. There's a variety of plans available. So there's lots of versions uh, on the NAC website that you can download or on other websites, Royal Children's Hospital, for example, um, wherever you look, you'll find a written asthma action plan that will be able to be downloaded to your practice software and utilised. So what's different with community first aid? These are the new first aid charts for adults and children that NAC have just released recently, I think uh, this August this year, a couple of weeks ago. So if you want those new charts, you can download them from the website or once again, if you want them in paper form, you can uh, order them and they'll be sent out to you. But our first aid protocol uh, remains the same. So generally we're using um, SABA, so four separate puffs of reliever medication via a spacer. Take four breaths per puff, wait four minutes and then repeat. So it's really important that we understand people know how to do this properly. And I'm just going to take this opportunity to preach to the converted, I hope. So we remember that we're always shaking the device between each spray. We're using a spacer so that it takes away the need to time the spray and the inhalation. One spray in, four breaths in and out. Have a little rest. Shake again, one spray, four breaths. Repeat. It's really simple. The biggest thing that people forget is to shake the canister between each dose. We do that so that the medication is mixed with the propellant and you're getting a full dose with every spray. All right, so thunderstorm asthma, that's a little nutshell of the information that we need to know about allergic rhinitis and and then what which is right now and thankfully why you've all tuned in tonight to have a listen so at your clinic as i said now's the time to be preparing so proactively review people with asthma see if you can um, get them in do some reviews assess their control assess their allergy management ask if they've been affected by springtime asthma in the past or a thunderstorm asthma event in the past check their medication adherence, check their device technique, check they've got a written asthma action plan. That's what we would do in an asthma review. Now's a great time to be doing it. But encourage everyone to be aware of the high pollen days and a thunderstorm weather forecast at this time of year, remembering that in um, Victoria, Southern Australia, we're mostly thinking about November. Ensure that all the bronchodilators in your clinic are in date and that you've got a good supply and have a supply of spaces as well because people may be coming in or may um, need to get these from you. Have a clinic policy and I wondered how many 
practices do have a clinic policy for patients that present with acute asthma. It's a really good time to be talking about this at a clinic level, at a staff meeting perhaps. Make sure that everyone in the practice is aware of the plan of um, action if someone presents with acute asthma into your clinic, the charts are really good to have on display. Um, telehealth's available during COVID-4 reviews. That's still available at the moment for some practices, so maybe I would utilise those. Or there's a 1-800 asthma number, which is offered by Asthma Australia, and that's called the COACH program. And that might be a way that you, that's a number that um, public can ring uh, to discuss uh, their asthma with a health professional. And that might be a way if you can't get some people into the clinic or you can't review them, then maybe you can suggest that coach program for them. And at least they're getting health professional advice about their asthma management. At the pharmacy level, it's also a really great time to be thinking about asthma management um, and allergic rhinitis management. So ensure good supply of asthma medications, rhinitis medications, adequate supplies of spaces. This resource on the slide there is an updated flowchart for pharmacists that's available for people presenting uh, with asthma into the pharmacy. So it just talks about um, the questions you would ask and the treatment that you would offer. So once again, a good opportunity to be discussing uh, with all staff in the pharmacy, uh, their responsibilities about asthma and allergic rhinitis management at this time of year, training all staff in asthma first aid, have the resources available, know which clinics in the area are open and able to assist if an event occurs out of hours or at different times of day or people are going to come into the pharmacy asking those types of questions. And for patients requesting hay fever medications, then it's a good time to ask about asthma symptoms as well. And I know um, a lot of pharmacists are doing this now because I went in to buy some Nasonex a few weeks ago and I was really, um, uh, really interested to know that the pharmacy assistant that came to talk to me uh, spoke to me about using the intranasal corticosprays sprays correctly and also spoke to me about the um, oral antihistamines that I was buying. So I was very impressed with her and I told her so. It was great. So just things to consider about your workplace. Do you have an emergency asthma plan policy? Uh, do you think you need one? We never need one until we need one, but it's really good to have it in place before then. Whose responsibility is it for the different aspects of care? And is there a consistent approach to emergency asthma management within your practice amongst the practice nurses and the GPs? And does everyone in the practice know where the reliever is kept? And please refer to the asthma handbook if you need to. It's got lots of information in there. So asthma and COVID. We can't stop talking about COVID yet, much as we'd really like to. There is a section in the handbook on management um, of asthma and COVID-19, of course. So we would um, still be checking that everyone with asthma has a current action, a, asthma action plan. If they need it, um, we are back to performing spirometry in some situations. And please have a look at the uh, latest recommendations both from the Thoracic Society of Australia and New Zealand and the National Asthma Council regarding spirometry and, and spirometry infection control throughout COVID. Um, advise anyone with asthma that they have to continue with their asthma medications, including their inhaled corticosteroids, even if they do have COVID. Um, only using oral steroids, of course, the severe asthma flare-ups that hasn't changed at all but what has been a really great opportunity is to try and avoid using nebulizers there was a lot of talk um, early in COVID about the risks of nebulized therapy so a well-fitting mask uh, and spacer is preferred to nebulizer at all times but particularly through COVID and once again just a good time to remember not to share any medications or spaces we we advise that anyway but um, a situation like COVID has brought that to the fore. And just leaving you with a little thought about how would we manage a, a thunderstorm emergency event during COVID, as I said, let's hope we don't have to actually do that. There's lots of resources available for you in terms of um, 
thunderstorm asthma events, and of course the asthma events that I've talked about. So that's the end of my presentation tonight. Um, these are the resources that I've talked about that are available through the NAC website, and you can download those yourselves, or you can get them. Uh, you can get them sent to you if you want to. You can order them online. And I'm just going to pop up a little slide with our uh, QR code there for the evaluation. If you could fill that in now uh, while we're talking about questions, that would be great. Or it will be uh, sent out to you in the chat or emailed out to you if you need it. So hopefully there's a few questions now. Um, Trish, oh, I have yeah, I have a few you. questions, um, Mark. So the first one is: Is there a difference between someone having skin prick allergy testing through their GP and or and seeing a specialist? So basically, having this in prick allergy testing with their GP? Um, that's a really good or question. No, there's not. It's just that um, a lot of allergens are um, quite expensive. So the actual allergens that are used to do the skin prick tests are very expensive and they do go out of date very quickly. So over time, uh, fewer GPs actually offer the skin prick test because they have to have those resources available for them. Uh, it's certainly possible to do it correctly in a GP clinic. There's no problem with that. It's just whether they would have the allergens in stock to do the tests. Thank you. Um, next one, how to re reuse spaces. Can they be washed with warm soapy water and dried and reused on another patient in a GP practice? Oh, <laughs> that's a common question as well. Um, certainly we wash all spaces in warm soapy, soapy water and they're air dried and we do that to reduce the uh, static buildup so that medication isn't caught onto the sides of the spacer but if they're going to be used in a in a medical um, practice then they should also be the autoclavable type so this one that I demonstrated that's an autoclavable spacer that's the breath protect spacer and that can be autoclave so it would be washed, then water carved, and then if you don't want to prime it with um, Ventolin before you use it next time, you would just wash it again after it's been sterilised. And to do that, but it can be done, or there are uh, some single-use spaces now available. So ones such as the little paper or cardboard light air is a brand that I'm familiar with. Okay, so the next question, uh, when will we use corticoid in, aller in allergic rhinitis? Uh, so oral corticosteroids was that? Um, it's not specified, so maybe okay, you can so, both. <laughs> yeah, so um, we would hope that people don't need oral corticosteroids to treat their allergic rhinitis. Um, it's an inflammatory condition. Uh, if it's rhinitis without infection, it can be it can be managed very effectively with the intranasal corticosteroid sprays. So they're ones such as Nasonex, Rhinocort, Beconase, Flixinase, those types of sprays. If they're not as effective for folk, uh, then they can be prescribed the combination sprays, which is the antihistamine and the corticosteroid. That's one like Dimista, for example, or Rialtus. Uh, if they've got infection there, so they've got allergic rhinitis and sinusitis with infection, then they may need antibiotics to treat the infection. But we would be trying to avoid oral corticosteroids for allergic rhinitis. Okay, now someone else wants a tip. Um, how can you prompt parents to get their child's asthma reviewed when their main response is they only use Ventolin when needed? Sure, that's a common problem. Oh, look, it's really hard, isn't it? 
yeah it's a really it's it's a really common problem um and i guess that's where schools and childcare centers help us a little bit because they expect a, an updated written asthma action plan every year so that means at least once a year hopefully uh they can bring in this has come from this has come from a school nurse so obviously the school isn't adhering to that policy <laughs> yeah, yes um well, I think it's, yeah, I think it's just something that we have to just keep re reiterating and saying that the risks of those, even with mild asthma, uh, are very real, that an acute asthma attack can happen at any time. There, there may be no warning at all. Um, we hate to use the fear factor, but springtime is a time when we can say, you know, we didn't know how many people were going to be affected by thunderstorm asthma and it affected three and a half thousand people. So be proactive, take the child to the doctor and get the asthma reviewed at this time of year is a really good way of doing that. It's a very good question, and I wish there was a really simple answer. Um, I think everyone does somehow, Mark. Um, so the next question is, yeah. in regard to S slash C immunotherapy, I presume subcutaneous is it, after the treatment, will it totally stop allergic rhinitis? Um, well, if we can clearly identify a trigger, so let's just use ryegrass pollen because that's a lot of what we're talking about tonight in terms of thunderstorm asthma. If we've done the skin prick allergy test and people have had a significant response to ryegrass, for example, and then not too many other multiple allergens, which is the real problem, and they can be desensitized clearly for ryegrass pollen, uh, that can certainly be effective may not be for life but that certainly will give them um, a good long years 15 20 years perhaps of that pollen to that uh, trigger where it gets a bit more difficult is if they've got multiple allergen allergens that they've tested positive to so perhaps they've tested positive to rye grass cooch grass some other weeds other things then it's a bit more difficult for it to be a completely effective desensitization because there's a limited number of allergens that you can be desensitized for at one time. So if you're going to go for the ryegrass and that's say a two year program, that's quite a commitment from someone. Um, but if they've got other strong allergens that can't be done concurrently with the ryegrass, then it's another couple of years for the next one, if you understand what I mean. So it can be more complicated, which is often why we need that um, allergen specialist to talk them through it and give them the best options. Yeah, okay. I've just got a couple more, um, Marg, if yeah. that's all right. Yeah, that's um, completely fine. So can you get disposable spaces to use as doctor clinics? I suppose, can you recommend where people should look for um, these? Yes, if you just give me a second, I think I've got one I can show people in my little kit over there. Just hang on one second. Sorry, digging around in my bag there. <laughs> so this is a light air spacer. This is um, is available, and you can get these through your medical suppliers or generally. So that's how they work. They're just they come flat, and then um, the, the device, the MDI goes in this end, and then people breathe in through there. So that's one brand that's available that I use in my clinic, uh, but there are other brands available. So check with your medical supplier or have a look online and see what's available. Okay, so the next question is a hard one. So you're going to finish off with a hard one. Well, it looks very difficult. <laughs> Saving the worst to last, yeah. Tricia. It looks very difficult to me, but I'm not clinical, so it might be simple for you. Okay. Um, this is from one of the attendees who's had their 12-year-old son at three GPs, three different prednisolone regimes, 
One was 25 milligrams TDS, one was 50 milligrams slash 37.5 and 25 milligrams. Now it's a longer term dose of 25 for three and 12.5 for three days. Is it all guesswork? Um, and second question, do you want to answer <coughs> that one first or will I? Um, well, I can try and answer that. Uh, so this is where we would be really encouraging everyone, GPs, uh, practice nurses and, and pharmacists to uh, read the, the um, asthma handbook guidelines for corticosteroid therapy in asthma, because that does make recommendations for doses on age for children and adults. And it does talk about the length of time for the corticosteroid doses as well. So it, it was um, in the past, it was generally higher doses and then sometimes back titrating and reducing doses. But generally the guidelines would recommend now that uh, oral corticosteroids are used for a shorter number of days in children generally three to five days and then there's no need to titrate the doses down and even for adults we're losing your um sound a bit mark um, uses up to seven to 14 days, there's no need to back titrate doses for corticosteroids as well. So I'd be really encouraging to, sorry, that's just the internet here is a little yeah. bit unstable. Can you hear me now? Um, yes, we can. Can you hear me now, Tricia? Yes, I can hear you now, Mark. Mm. Not now. Have I dropped out? Yep, you're dropping in and out. So do you want to turn your camera off, see if that helps with I your bandwidth? Okay. Are, are you talking, Mark? No. Yep, I'm talking. Okay. Will that help? I okay, so I just can encourage people. All right. People are very familiar with the current guidelines. That, that's the answer to that question. Yep. It's not guesswork, but it's whether people are actually adhering to the asthma guidelines as they're written. So they need to go to the asthma handbook and read the section on oral corticosteroids and then hopefully uh, the GPs would be prescribing um, to those guidelines and that people would be getting the correct doses and really no need to back titrate oral corticosteroids now if they're given correctly in uh, short days, three to five days for children, five to seven days for adults. I hope that answers that question for that person. Yeah. So the take home is the guidelines are key. The take home is the guidelines are there. They're written down and it, and it is um, current and up to date and should be what people are following. Okay. Now, next difficult question for me yeah. to, for me to read. Um, so does methylprednisolone put into joints have an effect on allergic sy symptoms? Um. Uh, it's probably outside of my scope of <laughs> practice there, but I, I would have to say I probably can't answer that question because I'm not sure about inflammation of joints. I can talk about inflammation of the uh, nasal cavity and of the lungs, but not necessarily joints. I'm sorry. Okay, no problem. So just one more. Um, yep. Why can we not use oral corticoid prenicillone for allergic rhinitis? Oh, well, it's not that we can't use it, but it's not our frontline treatment in terms of minimising uh, side effects for people and using the, the 
best practice medications that are available. So if you look for guidelines of management for allergic rhinitis, either on the NAC website or on the ASCIA allergy website, it will always say the frontline treatment is intranasal corticosteroid sprays first because it's treating the inflammation right where it's happening, right in the nasal cavity there. Oral corticosteroids uh, have a lot of side effects and there's a lot of uh, studies being done now uh, even if they're used um, in reasonable doses, but are used over a person's lifetime, they can cause side effects. So we're trying to reduce and minimise the use of oral corticosteroids as much as we can. All right, thank you. You're welcome. If there's any other questions or that are emailed in to you, just get just forward them through to me, Tricia, and I'll answer them via email if we need to after tonight. I'm, I'm just aware of the time for folk yeah. that's um, running a little bit late. Yeah, okay, Mark, thank you. We appreciate that. So um, participants, you're welcome to set, to email your um, questions to um, education at nwmphn.org.au and we will pass those on. Yes. So, Mark, thank you so much for such an informative evening. I've learnt a lot. Thank you. You're and, welcome. And um, thanks, everyone, for attending. Great. Thank you, everyone, for participating. And we'll see you at our next event. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye.